hey, congratulations on the new album. Thank Very you. good. Love that first single, that three piece first. That's like a ah, grand, grand, grand piece. And I know the 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 theme of the album, which is much needed. And thank you for doing that because sometimes artists just they they don't want to go there with this obvious thing that's happening to the planet. Tell me about the impetus of this, getting this together. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a very different sort of album, really, to try and write and record an album during a pandemic. Um, maybe took slightly longer than it would have done, but uh, Mike Hunter, our producer, did an amazing job and worked tirelessly to uh, to, to pull it together. Uh, we'd, we'd done some writing together before the pandemic, pandemic hit, really, so... Um, then there was a period of time when the band did some work without me because I was shielding and then we could work together again um, and then uh, we all had to work from home for a couple of months uh, during the lockdown um, and then thankfully we could we could uh, get back together in the studio again so it was kind of a bit stop and start the whole creative process on this record uh, and I know Steve originally didn't want to write about the pandemic um, but I mean that you can't help but but be affected when you're living through that this kind of moment in history, really. So, yeah, I mean, it comes through in several songs. Uh, obviously, the whole, um, you know, global warming, um, destroying our planet um, thing that kind of comes through as well um, in uh, in various places. So, yeah, that, that's that's just how how Steve tends to write. Really, he's very much affected by whatever's happening. I noticed that uh, uh, on your Facebook, you posted a picture. I'm not sure because, you know, you lose track of time during yeah, this yeah. time. I work out of my house anyway. I do a radio show over here. My YouTube channel does really well. But you lose track of time. You had posted a picture of yourself when you were either thick in your 20s or something like that. And at the same time, I was doing that. And a lot of people were doing that because they're going through their closets. They're finding old things. And I mean, you look like a dude, man. And I remember going, I used to look like a dude too. Like, what the <laughs> yeah, what, what, yeah, we're all young ones, you know. <laughs> what's that feeling like though? Because I'm, I, we just moved here from across the country. We're in Calgary and we just moved here to the East Coast where I grew up. And right. by doing so, I'm finding all these old pictures because we have to throw out stuff. And that's what you do. But I find myself, and I want to ask you this for a reason. I, I find myself looking at old pictures. I'm like, well, and I'm, I'm looking at that guy and I'm going, what did he believe in? And what, who was that guy? Do you ever do that? I mean, especially with that one picture you posted, I remember going, yeah, I remember that version of you because we're none of us are that version of ourselves anymore. It's impossible. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, this is a 43rd year I've been in Marillion. So it would be, uh, I'd need a picture up in the attic really to, to, to look the same. Um, yeah, no, you just got to uh, enjoy each moment in your life really as, as it comes around. And uh it's just, it's a funny thing when you've been doing this for so long, you know, most bands, if they kind of win, win the lottery, if they get to make a record, you know, but to be here 18 albums later, still doing it, it's just a, it's a miracle really. So, yeah. Did you find this album because of COVID, did you find, uh, uh, did you find it easier because you just had the time? Um. For me, the, the big difference is when there was a period of time when I couldn't work with the band, um, I, you know, I could do some work at home. I have my uh, a studio here at home. Uh, but then when we could all get together with the five of us again, five of us again, it was just a, a fantastic feeling, you know, like a, a freedom to do to do the thing that um, I love doing more than anything else. You know, it's like music has, has been my life uh, for as long as I can remember. And, and to be able to work within Marillion, you know, we have a very special chemistry between the five of us and, uh, and this, you know, there's no sign of that ever stopping, which is an amazing thing after all this uh, time. So, yeah, it's just a great to be able to express things in music, really, which was, uh, it was quite cathartic, I think, at times during this process. Well, you talked to a, a good friend of mine, Eamon O'Neill, I've never met him from Eon Music, uh, uh, I think a few months ago, and, and you, he had asked you about about, you know, coming up with these inventive parts, you know, of like, and you had responded, says, well, you don't, not sure where they come from, but you, you just, I mean, they just, I mean, you don't stay, you don't wake up at night and think of a guitar part. You don't like go, Hey, that'd be good. That, Cause no. you're so unique in that way. You've got, you come at me with your, with your guitar and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you come at, sometimes I'm going, where did he come up? He's like <laughs> Batman. Where did he come up with this stuff? 
Yeah, well, I honestly have no idea because all I can say is that um, when I pick up a guitar and start playing, I have no idea what I'm going to play next. So uh, you just try and do something that isn't obvious. You know, there's so much being already done on the guitar and there's million, literally millions of guitarists around the world playing the same licks, you know, and um, the guitar can, can be so much more than that. It's just, you just need to approach it in a kind of fresh way, you know, and, and, and deliberately try not to fall into cliches and try and find, you know, it's all there. It's all hiding, you know, it's all hiding within the chords, the melodies, the way you can, you can, you can find melodies within chords and, and you know, there's something beautifully random about the guitar that if, uh, if you come at it in the right way, you can just even now come up with fresh and interesting things. Like Care, for instance, the last track, I listen to the guitar part, I'm going, what the, yeah, it's like, holy <laughs> snapping turtles. That's what made, I, I, I mean, I'm listening to the whole album, I love your work, I'm, you know, I'm interviewing you, so I'm really paying attention. And I listen to that and I'm going, where did he, that is so beautiful, that just moved me. Oh, thank you, thank you. It is a, it's a, it's a beautiful track. I mean, I think, especially the the end section with the choirs. It, um, I mean, it brought a tear to my, to my eye the first time I heard that because when you make a record like this, you know, you don't get to hear all the details until you come to mix it. So, uh, you know, I knew we we were trying this choir, but I hadn't heard what the result was. But then when you hear everything in context, uh, and it's just so incredibly moving and so emotional um so yeah it it's a very special very special moment for me i don't know your family life but did your parents get to see your success were they still around did they, the uh yeah well it was my mom that brought me up and, and she was kind of my biggest fan really so yeah she came to um to a lot of the shows um she sort of died i don't know how many years ago now maybe eight years ago just before my solo album came out, The Ghost of Pripyat. Um, but yeah, she was always my my greatest supporter. How old were you when you started? Um, 15, really. Um, 16, seriously. Well, I, I decided when I was 15, I wanted to be a professional musician. So I left school at 16, played the guitar for about 10 hours a day for the best part of a year, and then joined my first band, just like kind of local bands in the small fishing town, Whitby in North Yorkshire, where I grew up. And then... Just a couple of years after that, I joined Marillion. So quite young, really. I mean, 19 to to kind of, you know, move away 250 miles and give up everything and follow your dream, you know. Did you really have to change the name because J.R. Uh No, it was just we wanted something maybe a little bit less obvious. Less uh, syllables. Yeah, and, and um, we had various flight cases that had been uh, stenciled with Silmarillion. So we thought, well, we could just get rid of the sill and, you know, <laughs> we can still use the cases. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good, it's a good name. Um, yeah. There was a big question mark when Steve Hogarth joined the band, whether or not we should change the name. And uh, I didn't really feel that we had to, because it's, you know, I think I'm proud of everything that the band's achieved throughout our career. So, uh, for me, Steve joining was just another another chapter in that story. Well, I know you're a big Genesis fan, and I know that you've been compared to Genesis, but you guys did what ha- went through what Genesis went through. You lost your lead singer. He wasn't in the back on the drum kit in this case. Mm-hmm. Um, was was when Fish left? I mean, was what was your first impression of going? Did you go what, what the hell? Because every band goes, mm-hmm. what the hell are we gonna do? Not really, because we'd already written quite a lot of music um, that finished up being on Season's End and even some parts of Hollywood and Eden. So, um, you know, there was a confidence in our musical strength still. We just had to find the right person. You know, we didn't want to find a clone of Fish. We wanted to find someone who was interesting in a different way. And it took a long time. We auditioned a lot of people, listened to a lot of cassette tapes. But eventually, yeah, we... We came across Steve Hogarth. Is there anybody we'd know that you auditioned? Not really. No, I mean, you know, just some some of the guys were like general rock vocalist types who just were in a very different area of music. There were some singers from the younger prog bands, some of whom really desperately wanted to be fish. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's completely not appropriate at all for what, for what we were trying to do. Uh, Foxtrot turns 50 
I think it was Steve Hackett's second album of the band. Steve Hackett, by the way, is the one guy I've interviewed more than anybody else in 38 years. Yeah, well, Steve's, just... a great, Steve's a great friend of mine. That we, I see him quite regularly. We, I mean, we've been working on a project together on and off for several years. Um, but we, we meet up regularly. In fact, I'm seeing him next week. Um, we go out for dinner quite a lot, him and no his wife, Joe. Yeah, him and his wife, Joe, and me and uh, my wife, Joe. So it's two Steves and Joes. And, uh, yeah, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. I had a box at the Royal Albert Hall for the Cirque du Soleil, uh, and he was my guest there for that, as well as uh, Jacko Jacksticks from King Crimson and, yeah. and Nick, Be Nick Beggs. So, uh, but are you strategic about that? Who picks the order of the songs? Um, well, you try different things for the running order and, and see which kind of, which one complements, uh, you know, each other the best, I suppose. Uh, we always thought that Care should finish the album just because that um, that moment, like say with the choir at the end, you can't really kind of top that. So, uh, but everything else was kind of open to uh, to interpret, you know, to various different um, running orders that uh, until we found the thing that we we thought worked the best. So, but was there a time like when you first started meeting these people um, who were your your idols? Was there a time you had to pull yourself back and say, I got to be cool here because I possibly could be a friend with this person? Uh, well, I'm, I'm naturally quite shy. So, I mean, I was, I'd be lucky to, to meet, uh, well, to be in the room of all three of my idols, which is Steve Hackett, who's like I say, who's now a friend, Andy Latimer from Camel, uh, who I know reasonably well and presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Prog Awards, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Uh, and I've been in the same room with Dave Gilmore several times, including backstage in his dressing room after the, the last London shows. But I've never had the nerve to say hello. I've never had the nerve to say, hey, Dave, I really love what you do. You've been a great inspiration to me because I'm just not that guy. You know, I'm not that guy who feels comfortable doing that. Like some people just have so, so much front, as we say, that, you know, they will go and talk to the Queen, you know, where yeah. I'm very kind of like, I'm just not, I'm not wired like that really, so. Uh... But it's it's strange, I've been studying British bands and in any North America is, uh, they're, they're stupid not to go into and at least research British bands that for whatever reason, there's a lot of Canadian, I'm Canadian, <clears throat> there's a lot of Canadian bands that barely stretch a April Wine, Chilliwack, all these bands that Trooper, they were big bands in Canada, huge bands in Canada, yeah. but for whatever reason, there's so many different moving parts never made it in North America. Uh, uh, and and uh, what do you think the reason is with you? I mean, you're obviously a legitimately huge band. Yeah, I mean, we've always done a lot better in Canada than we, than we have in, in, the, in the States, really. It's, um, I don't know, maybe, I think a lot of the people who like classic rock or progressive rock you know, have their favorite albums from the 70s. And, and it's like a lot of people who love Floyd, you know, they love that, but they're not interested in discovering anything else. It's kind of quite a closed-minded mentality when it comes to music. Um, Prague is a strange genre. Prague is, just, I, listen, I, I just got to interrupt you. When I first yeah, started in, in, interviewing the Prague guys, like John Anderson and all these guys, I'd interview them and they put it on the Prague. Someone would share it. I can't because it's my video. And people would go, hey, wait a minute, who is this guy, this John Bowden guy? Like, what's going on? I first started doing videos a few years ago. It's almost like they had to accept me and say, oh, I guess he knows what he's doing. It's okay. They're just a slightly different mentality. And by the way, I respect that. Part of that yeah. I respect is part of the game, you know? But they're a little, they, I just, they had to, uh, I, there was a rite of passage there somehow. <laughs> no, I think so. Um... But, you know, you look now and, and still when it comes to the uh, top guitar solos of all time, comfortably done seems to, to win every time. So, uh, yeah, there is a general um, understanding of how great prog can be. It's just it's it's no longer or it hasn't been for a very long time, a mainstream um, style of music, I suppose, really, even though a lot of contemporary artists kind of have prog elements in sometimes in what they do. But uh you know, prog in the way that we, I suppose, we're known as. Um, it's still, you know, we, we exist in our own little corner of the music uh, universe, I think. 
Foxtrot might not be one of your favorite albums, but do you have anything to say about that album turns 50 this year? I'm asking everybody. Uh, no, I absolutely love Foxtrot and Nursery Crime. Uh, are probably my two favorite Genesis albums. I mean, parts of Selling England as well. Um, those three, but uh, yeah, Foxtrot's very, very special. Supper's Ready is just, to me, that's, we did a poll a few years ago and Supper's Ready by far was the number one song, but this was Prague fans. We asked Prague fans. I think one of the fascinating things about Supper's Ready as a track is that some of the guitar parts in the first part of the song were written by uh, Tony Banks. You know, not only is he an amazing um, keyboard player and writer, but you know, even on the guitar, he was coming up with, with really interesting uh, movements. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite quite phenomenal, really. Do you ever have people mispronounce your name? Not very often these days. Yeah, because once you're out there a little bit, it just because uh, I used to say your name wrong. I, I used to have when I first because I was not paying attention, didn't realize it was going to be a rock guy. You know, didn't know that. Uh, I used to say Rotherby. And one day some guy said at a party, what the hell, man? I went, what? Isn't that his name? Because we didn't have the internet back then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had a little cassette and the cassette, I couldn't read the freaking liner. I was like, cassette. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going, so sorry about that, by the way. There's, there's oh. a funny story. Okay. Story about that, actually. Uh, we have an American um, fan who decided to name his daughter Rothery as her first name. Um, and she's now like in her twenties. She she came to the show we played in Edinburgh um, in November, uh, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a, an incredible compliment that somebody would name their child Rothery. Uh, and she's yeah, very very sweet, very nice 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 young lady. Incommunicado. I know it's the, from the other phase of the band. To me, that's you know that that song's always stuck with me for whatever reason. As far as you know, singing in my head. Is there anything you can tell me about that song? Um, well, it was obviously, it was the first single from Clutching and Straws. Uh, it's, it was always a great live favorite, so much energy to, to play. I still play it uh, when I do my solo shows. Um, we don't tend to play it much with, with Marillion these days, occasionally. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a live favorite. Uh, reprogramming the Gene. Um, that song created from the new album, it's, it's just created pictures for me. It's just like, I, you know, certain songs do that for various reasons. Um, don't want to say goodbye to the earth and sky. Anything you can tell me about the, the making of that tune? Um, it's one of those things when you, when you make a record like this, you, you tend to sketch out the musical arrangements um, and see, well, maybe sometimes only have a few fragments of lyrics. Uh, it's as the song develops, so will the lyric. So again, we're saying about with the choir. When you come to hear the mix, you 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 hear all these extra words that were never there in the first place. So uh, it's quite fascinating to to hear how it develops and progresses. But uh, I think it's a, it's a great lyric that um, you know. Steve does <laughs> he does talk a lot of sense, which is what you want really in your lyricist. <laughs> Well, I like when he had said, because I, I watched all the videos for the band members, the, the new ones you guys have done, because I love that kind of stuff, because it gives yeah, yeah. me a sense for what you're like. But he had said that when he sat, you know, first of all, you, you started playing and he says, well, just sing along and just come up with words. And I'm going, that's chemistry, man, to be able to do that on the spot. No, it's, it's, it's unlike anything else. And the thing is, we, we all have quite different tastes in music. It's, it's where we overlap. That the magic happens, I think. You know, when when we're all tuned to the same celestial radio, that uh, you know, there's something just seems to be born out of the ether. You know, just like the ghost of an idea that takes form and and substance and and almost in front of you becomes something. It's uh, quite a magical thing. What do you what do you think it was about? I heard you had said that you when you were younger, you'd liked soundtrack music and war soundtrack music, which mm. is something I share with you. I've always loved that. There was just something about it. I couldn't explain it. I, there's no reason. Nobody's in the army in my family. But what do you think it was with with things like that? Your imagination? Um, uh, just very stirring, very um, dramatic, I suppose. It was kind of like, you know, some of the um 
the sounds and textures you would hear in classical music, but maybe in a more straightforward, hooky, hooky way. You know, a lot of Ron Goodwin scores, um, like 633 Squadron and Where Eagles Dare. Um, and then, you know, I love the like the Bond soundtracks as well, John Barry's work yeah. uh, with the Bond soundtracks. So, and that kind of continued, you know, through all, all the way through. Even now, I mean, I love the, the soundtrack to Paris, Texas, the Ry Cooder's slide playing on that, so evocative. Um, the Blade Runner soundtrack track, uh, Vangelis, is, is, is one of my favorite records. Um, so, yeah, it's. It's, it's one of those things that I wish we'd actually had chance to do a soundtrack. The only opportunity we ever had was really doing the, the tour for Misplaced Childhood when we were at our most successful in the mid eighties. And we were initially approached to do the Highlander soundtrack, but we couldn't do it. Uh, and uh, that, that, What do you mean you couldn't do it? Why, why couldn't you do it? Because we were touring. We, we, committed oh, to, to, we, we toured for nearly a year and a half on, on the back of uh, Misplaced Childhood as it was, going up the charts all over the world and uh, yeah we couldn't do it and yeah that telephone never rang again unfortunately <laughs> i'd heard and he's a car fanatic i'd heard that uh you did splurge and get yourself some porsches uh what did you have i know you don't have one now but um yeah i've had various ones over the years my first one i had a, a 944 lux um then i had a 944 turbo uh which i, I had for quite a long time um I, I tracked it a bit, uh, drove it down to the uh, Chateau with the Dordogne when we made the Brave album in, in 92. Uh, I also had a, a, a white 928 S2. So I had a white 944 Turbo and a white 928 S2. It was like, the, the 928, was, I said was my wife's car, but so that was, <laughs> yeah, I was okay. But it was it was a bit insane, you know, because they're not the cheapest cars in the world to run. Yeah. And then, uh, um, you know, you kind of you, you you buy one even secondhand for like forty or fifty thousand dollars, and then you you sell them a few years later um, for maybe a quarter of that. So, uh, but don't you notice now the car market's insane? I mean, it, oh, it's totally, yeah. strange. Now it's an investment to buy the right yeah. car. Yeah, no, my last real extravagance, I had an um, uh, an M3 that I sold the V8 M3s. Uh, but these days, um, just like a BMW estate, I've got a little mini John Cooper Works, which is a great fun little car, and a, and a, a Miata, uh, 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 Unos uh, R Limited, which is, again, a car that I've tracked quite a lot. It's not the fastest car in the world, but uh, on a They're silly fun. day with the roof down, it's just, yeah, just so much fun. Okay, Steve, I'm going to ask you, do you, um, it's, I ask everyone this because I'm doing a video on a, a whole bunch of artists. What's your hidden talent? Do you have one? Oh God. Uh, well, I don't think it's him, but I mean, the only other thing I think I've got any gift for is probably photography. Really, I, you know, I got I, I I brought out the first volume of my photo diaries, postcards from the road. Um, God, how many years ago now? Six, seven, eight years ago, uh, and I'm threatening to do volume two uh, at some point. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty good with the camera. I think I've got a, uh, quite a good eye for composition and I understand the technicalities. I heard you mention that, you know, nowadays with the, what we have in these, yeah, you, you, you can do that. Do you, you find yourself using your phone a lot? Cause you're quite good. Yeah, I do tend to use my phone more than anything else really. And I have tried carrying other cameras around, you know, I've got, uh, some great cameras, the Sony a7, um, S was it S3? Um, but by the time you've you've carried the camera, selection of lenses, yeah. you know, it's just like it's a colossal pain. The pain in the butt. So uh 90% of the what well, 95% of the time I, I just make do with my my phone. The uh the crow and the nightingale, another choir song, slow, beautiful tune. What can you tell me about that one? I love love that song. That's actually my my uh, favorite song on the album. Uh I think it's probably close to perfect uh, it's a great lyric it always uh, has been my, my favorite of h's lyrics on the album um i love the quartet in the beginning the the harp um and then again the choirs at the end <coughs> and the guitar solo um it just reaches that kind of emotional peak that that you aspire to when you when you try and uh, write a great track okay i'm going to ask you 10 quick questions and i'm going to let you go to, to, okay. I ask everyone this. In high school, were you known as the music guy? No, I never had any music lessons uh, at, uh, at high school. 
uh, apart from in primary school when I was about six or seven, I think the only music lesson we ever had consisted of hitting empty paintings with sticks. Um, <clears throat> that is the some extent of my my music training. Uh, so you so taught I've, yourself? You taught yourself? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple of books. Uh, there was a book about ragtime guitar. Then there was a book uh, called Improvising Rock Guitar that had one of these floppy uh, records that you would put on the on the turntable. Uh, and yeah, and I had another book that was like a chord dictionary and maybe a little one, uh, one about a little bit of classical technique as well. Um, but the rest was just kind of putting it together, really. When, when you were that age, what were you listening to? Did you have a record collection then? You must have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Pink Floyd, Genesis, Camel um, were probably my three greatest influences. Okay. Beatles or the Stones? Beatles. Uh, Paul or John or the other two guys, George or Ringo? <laughs> um, George, actually. Where's I think so. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you'd pick George. So, what am I thinking about? Well, he's, he's, he played. He's played the perfect parts, and I think he's he wrote some of the best songs that the Beatles came up with. I think something uh, while my guitar. Uh, Here comes the sun. Um, yeah, great, great talent. I mean, obviously, you know, Lennon and McCartney get all the all the credit, and they, they've written the most incredible music. But uh, yeah, George had something very special going as any any guitarist who's tried to learn his parts can tell you you know it, it was it, it sounds deceptively simple but it's anything but uh, a piece of music has it ever made you cry yes probably um i'm trying to think what see for me it was joni mitchell i heard i heard the blue album and i i don't know why in spite of myself i didn't even yeah, no, I'd say that's that's probably up there. I mean, A Case of You is, is such a, a beautiful song. Uh, we played that at our wedding. Uh, it was really? one, of the, one of the songs we danced to, yeah. Uh, so there was that and a, and a John Martin song called uh, I Couldn't Love You More, which again is quite a slow song. Uh, but yeah, Joni is, is up there. I mean, she's written so many incredibly powerful songs. I mean, just uh, jaw-dropping talent. Um, Probably Amelia uh, from Hijera is probably my, one of my all-time favorites, just because it encapsulates the loneliness of the road, I think. Yeah. yeah. Coyote's always, I know that's the obvious choice from Hijera, but I love that song. Uh, ever seen a ghost? These are supposed to be different questions, so I'm gonna do, that's what I'm doing. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to such things. You know, uh, Rick Emmett, uh, Triumph, you know, the, the, the guitarist, I used to be a very new agey guy and I, uh, um, I'm not anymore as much and more of a realist now, but I talked to him and he, it's interesting. It was a great conversation. He didn't believe in anything like that. And I'm going, it was so sobering to talk to someone who just doesn't believe in that hookity spookity stuff. Well, I think when you're young, there's a kind of romance to it. You yes. know, it's like I was really into the whole kind of ESP and Yuri Geller thing until it, it came out that he was just a magician. You know, uh, UFOs still kind of fascinate me because that's because uh, I think there's something so romantic about the idea of aliens visiting mm -hmm. us, you know, and, and life somewhere else in the universe. Um, that so, James Webb telescope thing is exciting. That James Webb telescope very exciting. is exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all in position now. So... Yeah, the next next few months should be some stunning images. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really into astronomy as well. I mean, I've got this space themed album uh, coming out later this year called Revan Tule. Uh, I, I went down and played at the observatories in the deserts of northern Chile in uh, July 2019 for the full solar eclipse down there. So, yeah, and I've been, been down there a few times. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very much um, into the whole space thing. Cool. Uh, what's uh, what's been the, the highest point of your career? What what's just brought you way up here? What was it? I think that's really difficult to say. You know, in, in terms of profile, I think when when Kaylee was being a hit and and you were kind of you you catapulted it into the kind of mainstream uh success you know where you couldn't walk through the supermarket without being recognized i didn't actually enjoy that experience but i mean that was a definitely different you know kind of what did that feel uh, like when it first happened sorry to interrupt you but when that first happened what was what was that must have was, been 
Yeah, we were kind of on tour, so we were a little bit just bemused, you know, oh, well, it's going to go down. So all our singles, we have this pattern of the fans go out and buy them, they chart really high, and then by the second week, they start to fall, and by the third week, they're, they're usually out of the charts completely. So for, a, for us to have a song that actually didn't do that was just <laughs> bizarre. Did, uh, tell me about your guitar part on that on that tune. Yeah, it's... Um, my my uh, wife, who's my girlfriend at the time, asked me how I wrote music, uh, and I said it's all about combining melody and rhythm. Uh, and I picked up the guitar and said, "You'd do something like this," and, and started playing the uh, the Katie riff. And I thought, "Oh, that's pretty good. I'll have to remember that." Uh, biggest starstruck moment for you? Ooh. Uh, meeting Neil Armstrong. Wow. His his son uh, Rick, well, both his sons, but Rick especially, are, are really good friends of mine. But uh, yeah, we go go on a holiday with Rick, and he he was down in uh, the observatories with us. He played with me down there uh, in in 2019. Uh, he was over in in the UK for the for the couple of the shows there there for my birthday. Um, so yeah, but yeah, meeting his dad that's probably uh, you, you can't get more famous than that really. No, he's the first guy, right? Uh, yeah. um, what's the craziest thing a fan's ever done? Ian Anderson said he thought he had gotten shot yesterday, but someone threw a tampon at his chest. He looked down and he was bleeding. He didn't realize it was a used tampon. Now, you can't top that, but maybe you can. Um, I suppose, really, it's, it's like sometimes you see the tattoos that people have. You know, it's like one guy down in Brazil, I think it was in Rio, you know, sent this photo of this tattoo of his leg. And it's the whole of, like the, you know, the jester taken up with basically one leg. And it's like, okay, well, I hope, I hope you still like the band in 30 years' time. Uh, what scares you? Oh. I think the thing is... It, it, the older you get you don't really it's not that you get worried about yourself you just want want your children to to uh, live a, a long and healthy life really i think you know losing someone close to you uh under bad circumstances i think that's the scariest thing yeah top three guitars that's it last um one. top three guitarists i mean steve hackett dave gilmore um, Andy Latimer still for me in terms of the people I most enjoy listening to. Sorry, I mean, I meant, there's, there's so many. Sorry, I meant that. Uh, uh, um, uh, you can continue, but I also need top three of your guitars. Your guitars. Oh, my guitars. Yeah. Okay. Um, my blade, my vintage uh, blade I four, which is like a super strat with two singles and a humbucker. Um, which is a phenomenal guitar. It's been my, my main guitar since 99 with the Anarachnophobia album. Uh, my Squire um, Stratocaster, the, the guitar I bought secondhand just before we made Clutching at Straws and was my main guitar all the way through again until Anarachnophobia. Um, it's got EMG SA pickups on the Kayla Tremolo. Um, yeah, phenomenal guitar. Uh, and my Jack Dent... Uh, Raven SR, Jack Dent, uh, a guitar builder uh, down in North Carolina, uh, has made several guitars for me. Uh, and this is one I used on my solo album, The Ghost of Pripyat. Um, it's a very kind of slightly semi acoustic very resonant, again, two singles on a humbucker. Mm. 